Good morning, everyone, or depending on what time I finally get this uploaded afternoon, it is time for episode one of What Talk. I'm super excited. Let's go ahead and jump into it. So how I've decided to structure the show is to start out with just news, possible releases, and updates about the TV show. Um, it's going to be spoiler-free because I don't think any news articles are ever going to be like covering specific who died things regarding the TV show. Um, then we will move into spoiler-free discussion, just general spoiler-free stuff um, and overall theories. Then we'll go into the mild spoilers. I will put a warning and we will jump into theories about the TV show in terms of mild spoilers, things like that. Uh, and then otherwise, there will be a firm spoiler warning as I get into the comments and questions you guys have left regarding specific spoilery things, whether it's for the TV show, theories for the, just the books in general, all that fun stuff. And then we will finally go into the last bit, which is discussing the specific scene or sequence in the Wheel of Time that I've chosen to be the focus for this episode. And in this case, it is the opening scenes with Luz Theron creating Dragon Mount, which isn't super spoilery because it's the opening scenes, and I'll go ahead and make a clear, okay, no more spoilers, just discussion of the opening scenes now. So if you want to jump to the end at that point, you're more than welcome to. So getting right into it, let's go ahead and talk about this biggest update from Amazon, uh, where they officially said the script's not dead. And there's been a lot of reaction from this. Uh, I don't get why people are saying it's confirmed it's at Amazon because of this. We've, we've known it's been at Amazon, at least I, I feel like we did. There was so many people saying it and Amazon didn't deny it, which to me was just a confirmation. But maybe I was just uh, too eager to hear it's there. Uh, but all that the woman said who they were interviewing is the script's not dead. I haven't seen it yet and I will in the next coming weeks. So to me, it sounds like in the next couple of weeks, she'll get it, and I will probably pretty quickly learn whether or not they liked or didn't like the script and if they'll be moving forward with it. Um, do not take this as any kind of for sure confirmation there is a Wheel of Time show coming in my mind. I think there is probably, at this point, a 50-50 shot. A lot of series get to this point. A lot of series have scripts written and are either rejected or taken in. I think Amazon really wants it. I think they are eager for something on the level of Wheel of Time that they could turn into their own Game of Thrones. But they've also taken a stab at Lord of the Rings and Dark Tower, it looks like. And unfortunately, due to the popularity of both of those series right now being greater than the Wheel of Time, this is probably going to be taking a back seat for them. Um, I'm, I'm, well, this, and well, and I could be completely wrong. They could have huge plans for sure for the Wheel of Time, and that would be amazing. There's probably a decent chance of that being the case. I'm just tampering my own expectations because I do not want to be severely disappointed. Yeah, and it's, uh, they've, I'm looking at the sci fi article right now. It looks like they made a video, um, kind of just covering the Wheel of Time in five minutes. God knows how condensed that is. Uh, probably just the general concepts of it. And I, uh, that's kind of one of my biggest fears, though. That, that video is a good metaphor for what my biggest fear for the show is. There is so much to cover in The Wheel of Time. There is such a huge world built here. I would, I would say much bigger than the world created in Game of Thrones in terms of locations and peoples. Uh, I'm afraid that they will have to cut and condense and will basically get the diet version of The Wheel of Time. Um... And you know, I'm I'm trying to, I'm kind of caught between what I rather them take this super big swing at a fully flushed out realized wheel of time world or would I rather them just be like, "Nah, screw it, let's cut it down and do a really good job of a much smaller version of the wheel of time." And I'd like to know your guys' thoughts on that. Would you rather them try to conquer the whole series and really, you know, put a big budget on it and just go for it and possibly fail? or smartly cut out what they think they can and do a more condensed, maybe only Game of Thrones world-sized version of the Wheel of Time. Um, because as I've said it before, like this, this world is pretty much the biggest ever created in fantasy, in my opinion, in terms of just scope and the level of different cultures we see. Um, it's not as detailed as something like Middle Earth, where you can like trace everyone's heritage back in generations at this point, um, but it is created to a point where there's, but there is just more massive uh, levels of cities, cultures, different, like even the clothing people wear is so well described, you can just spot someone's nation by their dress, which is absurd. 
But yeah, that's that's pretty much the biggest news right now. Next week, we'll be going over the news of who so far has been announced to be involved with the show. There is one writer who is involved who did a lot of stuff that I'm actually really curious about, and I'll be doing more research on him over the week. And so next week, I'll be talking about this one writer and uh, his involvement with the series and whether or not I think he will do a good job, which would be, you know, completely subjective and Maybe I don't like his stuff and you guys do. Maybe you would like it. Maybe you guys don't like it and I do. So no big deal. So we are going to now jump into the spoiler-free kind of discussions. I've sorted through a bunch and categorized them as such. Part of me really wants the TV show to show the actual breaking of the world. I think it would be a good way to show the audience the potential power of a channeler. I think that's brilliant. Uh, I think it should be really the first thing we open up with, even if they are going to cut down the wheel of time to a smaller thing. One thing they really need to nail is that this magic system is just huge and so next level compared to what we're used to. I would be a huge fan of this. I think you're, you're hitting the nail on the head in terms of establishing what we need to. Um, opening with Luz Theron like the series does would be a good move. I think that would it, it would make everyone who go turn it would make everyone who tunes in for the pilot uh, really understand the scope of power in the world that they are stepping into. So I'm I'm right there with you a hundred percent. All right. So this is from Connor Kleck. Does this mean we can talk about why you think gender reversal is a part of the wheel of time? I'm not sure exactly what you're talking. You're I'm not sure exactly what you're trying to get at here. I think there's. Two different ways this question can be interpreted. Um, I've <clears throat> I've mentioned before that I wouldn't mind if they just put more you know diversity in the main groups and had like Perrin be a woman or something like that. Like it wouldn't bother me at all. I don't care about gender when it comes to character. Um, and I'm not saying I want that. I'm just saying it wouldn't bother me at all. It's something that a lot of shows are probably gonna be doing in the future for like inclusion and all of this. And I just don't care. A gender doesn't affect how I view a character. Um, or you're talking about the gender dynamic in the wheel of time entirely. Um, and I'm, I don't, it's not that I think that it's that people like Robert Jordan have said things along those lines that they tried to, uh, shift the power dynamic and make it so that because men are now associated with madness and things like that, um, they often get the stereotypes and the treatment that women do. Um, so yeah, it's not, it's not a personally me theory here. That's, that's something that's well established and been talked about. Um, which is so surprisingly few number of fans that I've met have really learned about that. If you look up things or if you just reread the series with the idea of, okay, how are men being treated? Um, very often they're treated in like the cultural wider approach as the ones with less power. Um, in fact, there's a question I think I already have pulled aside here uh, of saying like, what do you mean that there's more queens than kings? I misspoke. It's not that there's more queens or women in power than kings. It's that the most powerful positions are women in the Wheel of Time. Like the Queen of Andor, who's indisputably the most powerful queen. The the Amarlin seat, um, you know, basically the most powerful nations are either red, led by one woman or, an, or a group of men and not one man. Um, which for fantasy is extraordinarily rare. It's it's hard to find a fantasy series where there are more positions of power held by women, and that's that's just what I'm getting at for Wheel of Time. They just it's it's more of a let's just shake things up, and I think that got more meddled and lost as these series went on. Um, but especially when we're first introduced to the Two Rivers, the fact that there is a a women and men's council for the town uh, that seem to be on the same power level, or the men often kind of just giving in to what the women want. Uh, I think it was just kind of a neat thing Robert Jordan set up and kind of abandoned more later on um, for the series there. Um, but once again, it's something that I've just heard from, you know, people involved in the series. Oh, and here it is. It's from Daniel. Hey, you have the same name, Daniel Getsky. Um, yeah, he gives question. He gives examples of all kinds of men in power. Yeah, I, I agree. There are, there are lots of um, men in power, but a lot of them are corrupt or bad. Not all of them, but a lot of them end up being kind of the the traitorous, uh, you know, not loyal kind. I don't think this topic would be one of your first Wheel of Time videos, but what do you think of discussing Wheel of Time's early draft where the plot was massively different? Oh, so I wanted to address this question because unfortunately this is a big gap in my knowledge of the series. I didn't know there was these earlier drafts where apparently Rand was an immortal, or uh, Rand was Ryan and the big bad of the series was an immortal alien instead of the Dark One. Uh, that sounds amazing, and I certainly need to do more research on that, and I think that could be a focus 
of an entire Watt Talk episode down the road. So Dylan, thank you for giving me that idea, and that might be like an episode three or four thing, which will be uh, that'll be a lot of fun to get into. Now we have Carl O. Question: Should I buy a Heron Mark sword? I always wanted one as a kid, but now that I'm on now that I'm in my late twenties, I really have a hard time justifying the purchase. Uh, I'm going to quote the uh, the great show Parks and Rec. Man, treat yourself. Um, it's it's about you know as long as you have a stable income and a couple thousand dollars in the bank, go ahead and splurge a little. You know as long as it's not a uh, <laughs> I don't know why I'm giving financial advice in Wad Talk, but I think you'd be fine. They're only a couple hundred bucks, I think, and as long as you've you saved for it, you know maybe don't eat out a few days in a row. You know maybe maybe save a little, do the extra belt tightening. Uh, you should be fine. It's uh, it's all about you know treating yourself in general, man. You gotta you gotta do what you gotta do to be happy. All right, what are your thoughts on audio books? I found Wheel of Time as an audio book, and for some reason the prologue has been cut out. That's horrifying. Don't don't read it without the prologue. The prologue is amazing. After finding it much later, I liked it, but didn't think I'd have listened to the series if it was included initially. Oh, I didn't finish reading this question before I put it in this category. I, we, I will open up the uh, Luz Theron uh, talking. I will open up the beginning scenes talking with this question. So let me pull that aside here. We will definitely discuss that because um, I I have some I have some problems with what you just said. Do you like Egwene? I've gone back and forth on Egwene so many times. Um, I saw a comment recently that really changed my mind on her. You guys are great at changing my mind with the Wheel of Time series. I, I think she is a good character. Would I want to go get a beer with Egwene? No. Do I respect her for what she has done and accomplished in this series? Absolutely. Um, do I understand where she comes from? Yes. And do I agree with a lot of it? No. So, especially towards the end of the series, uh, without getting into spoilers here, she makes decisions that I just think are out of character and were one of the few real bumblings from Brandon Sanderson. And that's not saying Brandon Sanderson didn't do a great job. I really think he did, but I don't think he handled Egwene's final transitions and conflict very well. It felt cheap to me. Um, but that is purely a personal opinion. Okay, hey, I posted this in your video, The Future of the Wheel of Time, but I thought I'd ask you here as it would be a nice swap to talk. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. I'm sorry I didn't address it last time. Um, I do. I try to answer as many comments as I can, but guys, I'm crazy busy. Uh, I wonder how the potential video game would be set up, though. It's an absolutely huge world to do an open world for. I agree. Like my God, would we pick up? Would we just? Uh, would we pick just a part of it to be able to explore, or maybe fast travel around, similar to Dragon Age? Weaving would be a tricky thing. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, so I think in a video game, weaving would be easier to do than like in a movie because it can just be a you know game mechanic that is really visual and I don't think anyone would complain. You don't need to stick to as true as the book there. Um, and that's uh, addressing how we should do magic in the wheel of time is another lot talk down the road that I think people have strong opinions on and I'm, I'm very willing to listen for. Um, weaving would be, so, uh, so basically I think the story, okay. I think the story could be that you are from Immense Field. I don't like that. I think you should be able to choose just basically like, oh, do you want to set a start as an Aiel? I don't, I don't, I like a much more like Skyrim approach of like, what's your heritage? You choose, like just you figure it out and then maybe drop them, drop the character in like a place where it makes sense where they'd be for their heritage. And with, with the technology of games now, that wouldn't be a problem in terms of size. Um, I think the story could be that you're from Immense Field, but a couple of years younger, a couple years younger than Rand. I feel the farm boy trope is at the core of Wheel of Time. You know, you're not wrong there. That is true. If you want to make a story-driven Wheel of Time game, farm boy heritage is a big deal. <laughs> uh, that is that is a real part of the Wheel of Time mythos. Um, uh, yeah, there, that'd be a great options. Not going to read the next part of that. I'll, I'll block that out. Uh, but join... Um, Maybe you can do a video where you explore different options for potential video games. Yeah, that'd be a fun Watt Talk, guys. You want to, let's do a whole, that's like episode five now, right? Uh, we'll do a whole like video game potential for Wheel of Time. Just a thought. Maybe it could be a new video game format. Uh, okay, I don't know about a whole new format. I, I think sticking as close to like Skyrim mechanics would fit extremely well 
for the Wheel of Time world uh, in terms of size. You know, don't give me a full huge city. Give me a city that's like five blocks each direction, and I'll, I'll assume it's bigger than that in the actual Wheel of Time world. And you'll do you'll do have done a fine job beating me to, you know, experience it. Because like that's that's my favorite thing about Skyrim. It's like, oh, here's a city. It's five blocks. <laughs> uh, just go ahead and do that for you know. I don't need I don't need uh, Camelin to be New York. No, that's uh, that'd be impossible. Just a thought, maybe. Okay, so that's uh, that's about all I can do there. I think there's gonna be some spoilers later on in the comment, but yeah, I agree. There'd be some there's gonna be some great uh, potential there, and I like a lot of the points you made in general. Um, okay, so now we're gonna get into some more spoiler comments here. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw a timestamp down in the description. Pause it here if you want, and if you wanna go ahead for the discussion that's a part of the Luz Theron bit, just the opening of the series, click that, because uh, as of right now, I can't, there's no real soft mixed spoilery questions. A lot of these are just getting straight into some juicy, meaty stuff. So if you want that, go ahead and skip ahead. Um, I will go ahead and give you a moment. Okay, so great. So spoiler discussion, the, the meat of this video. Um, do you understand who killed Osmodian? Because I had no idea up until the end. Uh, also, I'd like to see more Osmodian, such an interesting and melan uh, melancholic character, though certainly not a saint. Yeah, Osmodian was great. Uh, in terms of who killed him, I think it's purposely left to me ambiguous. I know it's, it's hinted one of the Forsaken did it. I don't remember which one, honestly, because I... I think Osmodian's a fine character. I just never got super invested in him or his storyline. I don't know why. Every reread for me, I'm just like, oh, this dude's gonna fucking die. Like, even even the first time I read the series, I was like, he's so gonna die. Uh, I So yeah, I've never felt connected to Osmodian. Um, but I think he is a good character. And it's not that he's bad that I'm not connected. I just personally didn't care. Because um, it felt like a weird Moraine like male Moraine takeover training rain, rain thing. I don't know. It was weird. <clears throat> Who is Naomi? Oh man. I've seen good theories on Targaryen and her mother, the creator's avatar, the previous dragon and others. All we know is that she's not in the series as a shown character, implying that those spoken of, uh, implying that those spoken of are candidates. What happened to Rand in the final chapter's epilogue? Is he an avatar for the creator merged with the pattern or maybe even Teleron Riyadh? I've seen many theories would be keen on hearing you. Uh, God damn it, Alexia. Would be keen on he to hear yours on both of these two. My opponent, own opinion aside, what my own opinions aside would like to see what you think of them. But don't scratch yourself too. Th don't stretch yourself too thin, Danny. Please don't call me Danny. My name is Daniel. That's a pet peeve of mine. I think I speak um mass I think I speak in mass when I say we love your work. Oh, thank you so much. And greatly appreciate the overwhelming effort that goes into each video. Definitely deserves more subs. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um so I don't wanna God, so I said Tigarian, I mean Tigrain. Um so yeah, I there's a lot there to unpack. I'm gonna just dive into one of your key questions here, what happened to Rand in the final chapter slash epilogue, because the other stuff I honestly don't have that strong of opinions on. And there's certain mysteries that I don't want to solve. Like I, I prefer it to be more open <coughs> to interpretation, but when it comes to the final epilogue, that is certainly someone everyone should have opinion on. Excuse me, I need to get a drink of water. What happened to Rand wasn't him uh, joining with the creator or merging with the pattern or telling Riyadh. For me, it wasn't about him descending to some other level. To me, it was just a more of a direct, almost like a, not a fourth wall break, that's the wrong thing, but like a direct nod to the reader that Rand was done. To me, there was something about having him being able to do whatever he needs to do without the battle and the struggle and the horrific, you know, side effects of Sayadeen or the true source. To me, it was just letting the reader know like he's going to be okay. And I don't think the point was to ever get an answer of what exactly happened to him. I just think the point was to finally see Rand is at peace. And if you look at that final chapter, that final bit, it is so much about that. Like, my God, it's all just setting up Rand as being like, he's finally happy, guys. After 14 books, Rand gets to have true peace and happiness and be with the women he loves. Um... So that, yeah, that that is, that is to me all I've ever wanted to conjecture on it. I've certainly 
band I've certainly battered other theories around my head a little bit, but I've I've decided I don't ever want to fully know. I'm much more just, you know, whatever whatever happened, it's great. And it's more just a direct message to the reader, Rand's all right, guys. Which, after the shit he goes through, is uh, super what I'm looking forward to there. Uh, that guy needs a break. Hashtag Watt Talk. Thanks for using the hashtag. It made it a lot easier for me to find your comments if you did. What do you think would have happened to Shara after the last book? Uh, that's a good question. Also, if you were Rand at the end of the series and had gone through the terrible things that had happened to you slash done, would you ever try to reconnect with Tam? Go back to the Two Rivers. What do you think? Okay. I'm not going to get into the Shara stuff because I don't have much of an opinion there, to be honest. Um, I don't... It's, it's a good... It's a perfectly good, valid question. I just... I don't have strong opinions. I love the second part of your question, though. If I were Rand, I would have failed in the first book. <laughs> um, I, I, I would not have gotten to the end. I'm going to make that very clear. Um, like, guys, I'm, I'm an OCD germaphobe. There's no way I could, like, I'd sleep on the side of the roads with Matt. I'd be like, I'm out. I quit. I'm going to go be a terrible farmer and we're all going to die. Um... <laughs> But when it comes to the actual, like if I had gotten there, reconnecting with Tam, uh, yes, because Tam, Tam gets, does not get nearly enough credit. Tam is one of the wisest, most badass characters in the Wheel of Time, and gets and he needs so much more attention. Um, would I go back to the Two Rivers? I think I would go back to the Two Rivers and not basically be open or known about it. I would definitely, with all the powers. Rand has, I'd probably just chill out in the uh, Misty Mountains or whatever they're called and uh, just, you know, see my dad, see my friends when I wanted to and do that more or less, not ever trying to integrate back into the community because you would wreck any community you try to be a part of. Like, there's no way anyone could have a normal life with you around being who you are. Um, so in that term, I think, so in that, in that case, I would, uh, yeah, I would kind of become the man of the Misty Mountains that everyone talks about and whispers about is, is that rand is that rand yeah it is don't just don't talk to him all right he's been through a lot just let him let him be don't don't leave him alone that that would be that'd be my situation i like that all right <clears throat> hello daniel long time subscriber first time commenter dude comment more i like your i like your avatar one muhammad ali or your uh your thumbnail muhammad ali is amazing i would like to hear your opinion uh, on part in book eight, Path of Daggers, why Rand and the Sean Chan both thought they... Oh, uh, I would like to hear your opinion on part in book eight, Path of Daggers. I think you mean where Rand and the Sean Chan both thought they were defeated. I don't think they both thought they were defeated. I think Rand defeated both armies, and that was the real tragedy of what happened. That was a scene where Rand tried to be more powerful than he currently was. It's where he tried, it's where, it's where he had a Kanye moment. Uh, he thought he was this like, oh, unstoppable, you know, perfect thing. And this is a real important turning moment for him where he really got humanized and brought back down to earth. Um, so yeah, I, I love that scene. I think it's one of the most pivotal moments in all of Rand's story involving Kalidor. If you watch my Rand Kalidor video, you know how I feel about that. And I think it's one of the biggest turning points for him because up until then he had just been arrogant as shit. He had been kind of bullying people around and then he just gets humbled. Um, he, he gets humbled straight up. Um, so he went from being on his Kanye vibes to a much more humble approach. Um, and it's, it's such a, oh God, it's such a bold writing choice to have our main character kill not just an enemy army that's full of, you know, decent guys that are just fighting for what they believe in, but his own. Like, that is that is dramatic in every sense of the word, having uh, our main hero do such an uh, unforgivable thing. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I, I love that. I think it's one of the top ten scenes in the Wheel of Time, and it's something that I don't think you're brought up on this channel yet. So, KT to God, good question, my friend. Uh, I, I enjoyed that. So, we are going to slip into the Luz Theron scene talk here. Uh, we have quite a bit of responses, so I appreciate you guys responding to that. And we'll go ahead and jump in here. So, with Jennifer Doe's 
Um, I'm going to show favorites and say that Landon Perrin should have won. Oh, she regards the tournament. That's they're both amazing characters. As far as opening scene with Luce Theron, I think that is a great way to set up the series and a cool way to see what could go wrong with male channelers. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it, oh, there was a question I wanted to open this section with. Let's jump back to that real quick. I will finish your question, Jennifer Davis. Um, so First found as an audiobook and the prologue had been cut out. After finding it much later, I liked it but didn't think I'd have listened to the series if it was included initially. So with, uh, yeah, so this this actually hits on a good point. If you understand the context of what's happening in the opening scene, it's so powerful. It's, it's huge. But I think it's also undeniably a very confusing thing. Because uh, if you're just diving into this world first viewing, you got no idea what's happening. It's it's no no connection to these characters. It's just a weird, crazy guy mocking what seems to be an insane noble who's killed his family. Um, in hindsight, amazing, smartest way to open your series. Debatable because I think it could turn people off. Um, I think some people are going to read it and be like, "The hell was that?" And then just put down the eye of the world. So while I think it's an amazing scene. I'm not sure if it's the best thing to start the series with. So I, I, I think that was a fair point brought up there. But jumping back into the other one, um, as far as an opening scene with Luz Theron, I think it was a great way to set up uh, a cool, uh, the series and a cool way to see what could go wrong with male channelers. I agree with that. So I actually think this is a good, good connection with these two questions. Glad I'm answering them back to back. I think it was confusing for the books. But for a TV show, you could do it in 10 minutes, and that could be a great establishing thing. And with a more visual medium, it would be a lot less confusing, I believe. And we could also have, you know, just rewrite the dialogue a little bit to be a little more context given without just being an exposition dump, because it, it is a confusing opening. I think I remember vaguely when I first started Wheel of Time, God, 11 years ago, uh, that, that that scene confused the hell out of me. And I, I was a little turned off, but then I kind of just stuck with it Thank God I did, uh, but it, it's certainly, um, it's it's not the most straightforward scene, but it is a great setup scene. So it's, it's confusing whether or not that was a great choice. The first scene is one of my favorites, though I'm only on book seven. Interesting. But the columns of Roydion and the Shadow Rising, effing incredible. Yeah, they are incredible. Like, holy shit. Yeah, I, uh, without getting into spoilers here, you're right, it is incredible. Um, so, okay, that's just a guy being like, it's his favorite scene, or one of his favorites, so yeah, I agree. I just gotta say, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. I uh, love what you've expanded the channel, providing discussion-based environment. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm, my goal is here, man. I want you guys to be as involved as possible. This is not my channel, it's our channel. Uh, it's cool that you're involving the, cha uh, involving the channel. I'm looking forward to hearing your opinions on the opening of Loose Theron's scene. It'll be a huge moment for the show and settling the aesthetic for the future past, yes and that they will be referencing back for the rest of the series. Okay, this, that's why I pulled this comment. So the futuristic past, I love that you brought that up because it's... Okay, I made a mistake. Uh, my memory card filled up because I was recording audio and video, and so I got cut off there. Uh, that being said, I, uh, I'm just going to be recording Watt Talk for purely audio from now on because there's no way I can do, you know, 50 plus minutes of just uh <laughs> i hd footage and have that contained in any reasonable way so it's going to be an audio show guys and i'll probably have cut out the video and just uploaded the audio of the video i recorded before can't believe i didn't think of that but back into the comment i was talking about uh if i can get that re-pulled up i'm a i'm a genius clearly god damn it all right so um so this person brought up the futuristic past setting and to me, that was a brilliant thing to bring up because it's going to be a difficult situation for them to accurately bring into the Wheel of Time. This past that was a future, then we've shattered and broken this world. And it's something I think is worth a lot of discussion. So if anyone has any really strong thoughts and opinions on them building and establishing this futuristic past, uh, let me know because I'm, I'm curious myself and I don't have any strong opinions on yet yet of what should be done. Okay. Um, so that guy likes that I made a Goodreads account. I like that you like my Goodreads account. And I remember starting Eye of the World and reading the prologue and thinking, what the actual F is going on? I thought I'd figure out by the end of the book, and boy was I wrong. I'm planning on reading it and probably the first chapter or so again after finishing the series. It will be interesting to go back to the beginning. Yeah, it's that's what, I, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's a confusing opening in a lot of ways. I think 
it's going to be something that people struggle with a little bit because it's it's amazing establishment for the world but you have to be willing to accept the fact that you're going to be confused like they should just before the show starts have a guy come out and be like this is going to be confusing uh, trust us it's cool and then just move from there because 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 it's it's certainly something that uh it's not easy to process it's not easy to get 100 percent behind with that wheel of time opening gave me the same feeling as the prologue from way of kings complete mystery that's that's the point i'm saying that pulls the reader into the world i disagree with that a little bit even though the first time reader doesn't have any idea what is going on there but it wants to uncover the mystery if you're the kind of person who you need to figure out every mystery the eye of the world's opening is perfect for you um you're not gonna get your answer for a couple books but it's it i ah. Uh, it's, I think it really depends on who the reader is. I think, yeah, you, you guys get what I'm trying to say here. I don't need to explain on that anymore. So let's see. Okay. Favorite part of the prologue was definitely a Shamael. What a boss, especially on later reads. Yes, you are completely right. He, he Luz Theron was fine being a bumbling madman, but Shamael really stole the spotlight. And it's what, in my opinion, after, you know, reading and finishing the series and going back and rereading it, it, he is the bigger villain, in my opinion, than the Dark One. The Dark One, of course, is there. But Shamael, to me, he's he's the establishment of what evil is in this world. He's so important when it comes to every bit of movement and political development going on. I uh, Yeah, I'm, I'm a much bigger fan of Shamael as a villain than the Dark One. Really looking forward to the Wheel of Time talk, since I really don't have anyone in real life to talk about the series with. You and me both. I guess my first contribution will be, who who are your way to, oh wait, who are your way to early thoughts on who the actors, actresses should be? Personally, I think Stephen Delane would be a, make a perfect land, but I'm sure it'll never happen. In regards to the opening prologue, I love the way it starts the stage for the series and the books. I don't love what it ended up being in that it very rushed and badly produced in half an hour. Oh, you're talking about the opening. Yeah, the thing that was put out, that was terrible. Um, though they had, they had a really good actor for a show. I'm mad about that. Um, in terms of casting, I will do a much bigger video on that later on. I, I'm not going to just kind of quickly answer. Your question deserves a more well-put-together response. I did a joke, Wheel of Time casting thing uh that was mixed <laughs> mixed received some people thought it was great others uh, people called me a moron because they thought i was being serious guys i don't actually want gilbert godfrey as demon dread all right i uh that was a joke ha 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 um but that is that is the last bit on uh on this loose theron bit i will do a more thorough actual uh casting talk later on in wheel of time talk uh down the road but okay, so that was that was episode one of Watt Talk. It was you know it happened. I liked it. I think it was a uh, fun. And as the show gets closer, we'll have more and more stuff besides just discussions in general to talk about. But I actually really like kind of just establishing the show with just pure discussion with you guys. I think that's a really good way to start it. But moving forward for for episode two, the scene slash sequence I want to talk about is really just like the Beltine festivals in Emmons Field. Was it too wholesome for you guys? Was it too innocent? Or do you think it really juxtapositioned well with, you know, the horrible things that happened right after Beltine, the, uh, you know, town and village being attacked and all these things? Do you think it was a good progression for the series? Do you think it was a good establishment for the world? Because I've heard people say it just felt like nauseatingly wholesome to have this ceremony going on and everything. I hope you guys enjoyed this first episode of Watt Talk. I really enjoy going through it because God, I love this book series and it gives me an outlet to talk about something that's been such a huge factor for my life. Um, have a good one, y'all. Um, like and subscribe. Hit the Patreon if you want to see Watt Talk live and thrive until the uh, show comes out. And I hope you guys are having a wonderful day. Peace.